Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, everyone. Would like to get your attention as we get ready to begin. Hello, everyone. If we, if you all will take your seats, uh, we would like to begin the seminar. Um, but just a few announcements uh, right before I begin the introduction. Um, for the students in the audience, uh, well, for everyone in the audience, next week we will have the student town hall uh, during this time period. Um, so for all the students, please uh, show up, and it's going to be just for the students. Um, after uh, next week, the following week, we'll have uh, Adolfo Cuevas uh, come in, and will be our seminar speaker, Ben. Um, for those students uh, and for faculty, we're actually looking for people to help uh, support the seminar committee or the Freedman Speaker Series Committee. So please see me or any one of the uh, members uh, to help um, show your interest. With all that, um, we shall begin. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Freedman Speaker Series today. Um, we have a very interesting speaker um, who is well known uh, in our school and around. and so. Um, our speaker is Dr. David uh, Ludwig. Um, he's an MD, PhD, uh, and is an endocrinologist and researcher at Boston Children's Hospital. He holds the rank of professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and professor of nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Ludwig is co-director of the New Balance Foundation Obesity Prevention Center and the founder of the Optimal Weight for Life program, or OWL program, one of the country's oldest and largest clinics for the care of overweight children. For more than 20 years, Dr. Ludwig has studied the effects of dietary composition and on met, uh, metabol uh, metabolism, excuse me, body weight, and the risk of cardio, uh, cardi uh, chronic disease, with a special focus on low glycemic index, low carbohydrate, and ketogenic diets. Described as an obesity warrior, warrior by Time Magazine, Dr. Ludwig has fought for fundamental policy changes to improve the food environment. He has been principal investigator on numerous grants from the NIH and philanthropic organizations, and has published over 175 scientific articles. Um, he is also a contributing uh, writer, or was a contributing writer for JAMA for over 10 years, and, is pres and presently serves as editor for the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and the BMJ. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. David Lutzman. Thank you. Thank you for the um, wonderful invitation to come across town to this uh, important center of nutrition research. And because the weather was not too bad in February, I, um, I uh, decided to do the 50-minute walk over myself, so I saved your travel budget a little reimbursement fund. These are my conflicts of interest, uh, notably uh, royalties from books for the public. I don't accept uh, funds from the uh, food industry. The first law of thermodynamics holds that energy can't be created or destroyed. Applied to living systems gives us the familiar equation, calorie intake minus expenditure equals calories stored, or for humans, that means change in body fat. Now, according to the conventional interpretation of this principle of physics, obesity represents the failure of individuals to control their energy balance. So, uh, according to this idea, uh, we live in this environment, modern environment, with ubiquitous tasty foods. It's easy to overconsume, um, and we don't get enough physical activity with our sedentary jobs and lifestyles. So those excess calories build up in the bloodstream uh, as circulating fuels, glucose and lipids specifically. They get forced into fat cells, making them anabolic, making them grow. We gain weight and develop obesity. So the simple solution, we've heard it a thousand times. Eat less and move more. Now this view places the responsibility squarely on the individual to control their calorie balance recognizing, of course, that there's environmental determinants, and behavioral determinants, and biological determinants, but 
really, according to this energy balance view, it's up to the individual to control their calorie balance. The USDA MyPlate website said reaching a healthier weight is a balancing act. The secret is learning to balance your energy in and your energy out. Now, if you like the energy balance approach to uh, weight control, you really should love the first USDA food guide pyramid because fat has twice, more than twice the calories per by or per gram of carbohydrate. You know, we were told to eat all of them sparingly and um, instead load up on these starchy foods. Uh, remember, six to 11 servings of that. And if you add in the potatoes here, you could get up to 13 servings a day and comply with original recommendations. And the notion was that would spontaneously help people reach and maintain a healthier body weight. Now, the motivation for this paradigm was strictly one of energy balance. The USDA, uh, excuse me, the Surgeon General's report in the 1980s identified reducing fat consumption as the primary dietary public health priority, more important than any other aspect of the food supply. Reducing sugar was only a secondary is issue for vulnerable populations, such as children who were at risk for getting cavities. So presumably, if you just got your children to brush their teeth two or three times a day, they could eat plenty of sugar without any problem. Now, these are quotes. The nice thing about the list, the medical list, the scientific literature is that things that get published stay published. These quotes, these quotes are from 20 years ago. Now, base yourself for this. Uh, from leaders, society leaders in major nutrition journals. One group said when people are allowed to eat from ranges of high fat or high sugar foods, passive overconsumption only occurs with fat. It follows that fat promotes overconsumption. Well, sugar prevents it. Intriguingly, second group said, intriguingly, the evidence suggests that it is specifically an increased intake of sugars, not complex carbohydrates, that dilutes fat energy. And that the third group said, by decreasing the dietary ratio of fat to carbohydrate, we can attain macronutrient and energy balance without worrying too much about what kinds of carbohydrates we're eating. So all fats are bad, all carbohydrates are good. Based on this notion, the government called on the food industry to market thousands of processed foods that were reduced in fat and saturated fat. Now, if you're going to make a processed food and you're going to take out the fat, you're not going to put in fruits and vegetables or legumes. You're going to put in refined starches and sugars. And so the food industry flooded the market with these items. Um, my favorite is the fat-free half and half. But we also have reduced fat chips and the low fat Twinkies. Now, it's become fashionable today to say, well, wait a second. Nobody, no nutrition expert ever recommended these foods. This was mani industry manipulation and the public gullibility. But I think that's a selective amnesia. In fact, these foods arose squarely out of a academic scientific paradigm that was focused on energy density primarily and as promoted by the government. Of course, things didn't work out so well um, as the proportion of calories from fat declined. Um, we started eating more carbohydrates, as expected. We started eating more of everything, and those might be linked, as I'll address in a bit, and obesity prevalence uh, exploded during that time period. Now, this doesn't prove cause and effect. I'll try to make that argument later in this talk. You know that very few people can lose weight and keep it off for just a short period of time relative to a lifespan. Um, and the same issue is true in pediatrics, if, if anything, even worse. Most in interventions are almost invariably uh, unsuccessful. What little weight is lost temporarily is rapidly regained. So we have to ask, why is this paradigm that sounds so simple, just eat a little less, move a little more, and get rid of those high-calorie foods that are enriched in fat, why has this paradigm not worked? 
Well, one obvious problem is that it completely disregards a century of research to indicate that body weight is more about biology than willpower over the long term. We know that body weight is controlled by complex interplay of signals, hormonal and metabolic signals, that connect multiple organs in the body, such that when an individual of a baseline body weight, leaner for somebody who is habitually uh, thin, um, heavier for somebody who habitually has obesity, when that person is put on a low-calorie diet, they'll initially lose weight. That's the law of physics. But the body isn't a toaster oven. We're dynamic biological organisms. The body responds, fights back in characteristic ways to calorie deprivation. How does it do it? Well, the most obvious is hunger increases. And, you know, most people have trouble going from lunch to dinner without snacking in their cars. I mean, we even build cars that allow a movable feast with, you know, instrumental contraptions for beverages and food. So, somehow, this calorie... Um, directed approach to weight control, low calorie, low fat diet, implies that we're going to get hungry and we're supposed to ignore that hunger for the long term. That's, I think, by itself, face value, unrealistic. But even if somebody could, the body would fight back in other ways, which is, includes slowing metabolism. This has been well established. And these forces will tend to push body weight back to baseline. But the opposite also occurs with overfeeding, including a classic study done by one of your own, uh, Susan Roberts. With overfeeding, energy expenditure increases and hunger and interest in food uh, dissipates in the body's attempt to get rid of those extra calories and weight returns to baseline, giving rise to this notion of a body weight set point. But if we have a set point, we have to ask, why has this defended level increased year after year in the U.S. and elsewhere among genetically stable populations? So why is it that a man who was the typical, say, 5 foot 9 inches weighed 165 pounds in 1960, if you tried to overfeed that person and bring him up to 190, he would be unhappy. He would, he would be overstatiated and his body would, his metabolism would speed up. Today, that average man weighs 190. And if you try to bring him down to 165, his body's going to resist. Why is that? Well, we know that the problem can't be with the law of physics, which equates energy intake, energy expenditure, and fat storage. So keep an eye on these. These are set. But maybe our assumptions about causal direction are the issue. In other words, maybe the arrows don't flow from left to right. They flow from right to left. Now, this does not violate the law of thermodynamics either, but it puts the emphasis on the right side of the equation. This is the biological side. This is the behavioral side. So according to the carbohydrate insulin model, something has triggered fat cells to take in and hold on to too many calories. And so as a consequence, there are too few calories in the bloodstream, not too many, at key time points at least in dynamic stages of development of, of obesity. We'll, we'll go, more, go, go into that in more detail. And that triggers the increased hunger and re lowering energy expenditure. So from this perspective, recommending people eat less and move more is a best symptomatic treatment that disregards the basic problem of, that's biological and could actually make things worse. And we have evidence for this in every obesity clinic around the country. A patient comes in weighing 250 pounds. Uh, you put her on a low-calorie diet, she loses 20 pounds. At 230, she still has many extra calories stored in the body, but her body's already resisting. She's hungry, and her metabolic rate is slowing down. Why is that? It's as if the calories that are stored in the fat cells, those excessive calories, are not being perceived by the brain. And maybe there's a simple hormonal explanation for this. So what could be driving excessive fat storage? Well, endocrinology 101 says uh, pay attention to insulin. Insulin regulates the availability 
and storage of all the me major metabolic fuels in the body, stimulates fat synthesis, inhibits fat release, uh, excessive insulin action predictably causes weight gain, such as overtreatment of diabetes or an insulin producing tumor. Whereas under treat, under, states of low insulin action are associated with weight loss, such as that child with new onset type 1 diabetes. That's the kind of diabetes where the pancreas can't make enough insulin. Uh, before diagnosis, children with type 1 diabetes are often are characteristically polyphagic. They're very hungry. They may be consuming 5,000 calories a day and losing weight. And that weight loss will not stop until you start insulin at the right dosage. All right, so if insulin could be programming fat cells to store too many calories, what could be raising insulin levels on a population basis? Well, now we're talking Nutrition 101, all of those processed carbohydrates that flooded the food supply during the low-fat era. And we're talking about the amount, but also the type of carbohydrate the glycemic index, the concept well known to this group, um, which reflects how the same amount of carbohydrate digests and how much it raises blood sugar and by, by implication, insulin. Um, a related concept is glycemic load that puts these two together, and this is the best uh, measure of how blood sugar will actually change after a meal. The highest glycemic load foods are the processed grains, potato products, and added sugar. Low glycemic load carbohydrates include minimally processed whole grains. So not the kind of whole grains that you buy your bread at the supermarket where you could take a piece of this bread that's highly processed, even though it says it's whole, whole grain, so it's got fiber. You could kind of ball it up, drop it, and it'll bounce. We're talking about the traditional whole grains like steel-cut oats or pearl barley, rye, that uh, preserve the structure of the grain and therefore digest more slowly. Also whole fruits. So fruits get most of their, most of the calories in fruits are sugar. But because of the food structure and the intact fiber, digestion rate is slow. Uh, beans, dairy, or other low glycemic load carbohydrate-containing foods. Fats, have zero glycemic load. Fats don't raise blood sugar at all, um, which uh, will be relevant to our understanding of macronutrient effects on metabolism. So um, how does diet differing in glycemic load affect hormones and hunger over the short term? Well, this was a, uh, another study that I did with Stu Roberts um, 25 years ago. And uh, I was... Uh, we need to go out for a drink to celebrate this one. I think this study has got an over a thousand citations. So who would have figured by that? So it's just 12, we just studied uh, 12 adolescents with obesity on three different days. And we gave them breakfast with identical calories, but differing either in macronutrients, differing in macronutrients or glycemic index. So one was a instant oatmeal, high carbohydrate, low fat, processed but whole grain. But it was processed for instant cooking, so it digests quickly. We also have steel cut oats, which had the same macronutrients and even same energy density, um, but different in glycemic index. And then we had a third vegetable omelet meal with more protein and fat, less carbohydrate, and no high glycemic car index carbohydrate at all. And we checked blood sugar and hunger through the morning, then we gave them the same meal at lunch and checked and followed voluntary food intake. And here's what we found. So these are the hormones over the five hours after the test meals, breakfast. So as expected, insulin rose highest and the area under the insulin curve was the greatest after the instant oatmeal compared to the steel cut oats or the vegetable omelet. But there's another hormone that we don't typically pay attention to. It's made right next to insulin in the pancreas called glucagon. Glucagon does the opposite of insulin. They're like yin and yang. Insulin promotes calorie storage. Glucagon prepares the body to release calories from storage. And note that um, in glucagon was actually suppressed after the high glycemic index meal 
whereas it was secreted after the vegetable omelet, especially because of the extra protein. So, uh, uh, and, and so uh, this is a metabolic double whammy. It's going to cause those nutrients from the instant oatmeal breakfast to be avidly stored, but then the lack of glucagon is going to make it hard for the liver to release calories as blood sugar um, declines after the meal. And we see that here. After that initial surge of blood sugar, um, levels come rapidly down into a relatively hypoglycemic range in the late postprandial period. And C fatty acids also after this high glycemic meal are suppressed to a greater degree. Um, and that triggers a counter-regulatory hormone surge. The brain perceives this drop-off in calories, not at one hour, because remember, at one hour, your blood sugar is surging. You feel great. So you have the bagel, fat-free cream cheese, and orange juice for breakfast. After one hour, you're feeling fine. That's when a lot of studies stop, especially brain imaging studies. But the action isn't at one hour, in my view. The action is later, whether you're going to eat an extra snack or an extra large meal. And in our study, we found that when we gave free access to food in a, after, for, after lunch, subjects consumed six or 700 calories more after the high glycemic index meal. So if this is real, reproducible, even if a fraction of that difference were maintained, it could explain much of the weight gain we've seen as the glycemic load of the U.S. diet has increased. What could be happening in the brain at this time? To address that question, we uh, did a crossover double-blind study, which is um, uh, typically challenging to do in nutrition, um, with 12 men who had high BMI. We made milkshakes that had the same macronutrients, in fact, the same sweetness. We paired them, uh, we controlled sweetness with varying amounts of um, artificial sweetener. Same macronutrients. The only difference was the carbohydrate source. Uh, uncooked cornstarch in, in the low glycemic index milkshake, which is very slow digesting, versus corn syrup. So they're literally the same thing, came from the same species, just processed differently for different digestion rates. And then we did brain imaging. So we saw, uh, as expected, that higher blood sugar initially after the uh, corn syrup milkshake, and then the fall off in blood sugar. Participants reported feeling hungrier at four hours, despite the same calories. Um, that was a statistically significant comparison. And then we did arterial spin labeling MRI. That's a way of looking directly at blood flow um, at four hours. That was the time point that we specified of interest. And we found one area lit up in all of our participants. In fact, every participant had more activation in this area after the high glycemic index milkshake than after the low. So since there was no variation, our statistical power was very high, even though we only had 12 participants. So we could adjust for all of the brain regions of the areas of the brain and still get statistical significance. This area is the nucleus accumbens. That's considered ground zero for the classic addictions of cocaine, heroin, alcoholism. It's the center of the dopamine uh, dopaminergic um, pleasure and reward system, raising a provocative question that these processed carbohydrates could be producing something akin to food addiction, not because of their direct impact on us at the time we're eating. In fact, these milkshakes, again, had the same sweetness. These are effects that are persistent four hours later presumably due to their impacts on our metabolism. So, you know, we may be overeating these processed carbohydrates, not because they're so tasty. I mean, after all, think of the common binge foods. Bread, bagel, dry popcorn, um, sugary beverages. Are they really that tasty? No, they're pretty bland. But those are the ones we crave. We don't binge on butter, for the most part. There are rare eating disorders where people might. But butter, olive oil, you know, proteins, and high-fat foods and high-protein foods are not common binge foods. 
without carbohydrate, people tend not to binge. And I'll argue that that's not because they're so tasty. That's through biological mechanisms. So um, let's take a brief detour into the animal literature, because in human studies, you can never control everything totally. Um, so here we looked at uh, animals, slog dolly rats. We controlled their food intake through pear feeding, gave them identical diets, again, just varying the glycemic index of the carbohydrate, amylose versus amylopectin. Um, so the two groups over 18 weeks showed the same weight gain. But to achieve that, we had to begin to put the high glycemic an index animals onto a low calorie diet. We had to restrict their calories. What does that mean? It means their metabolism was slowing down. And so they were gaining more weight on the same calories. So we put them on a diet, they ate less to achieve the same weight, and despite that, they had 70% more body fat at the same weight. And this will be the one graphic slide. These two animals weigh the same. They actually have the same genetic background. This one ate more total calories, and it had very little visceral fat, it was metabolically healthy. This one was a metabolic mess. There's no way to explain this finding from our conventional calorie in, calorie out view of weight control, at least in animals. The question is, does this apply to humans? Well, we know that the behavioral studies um, show the opposite of what was thought. People tend to lose more weight on high fat rather than low fat diets. Now, these are all meta analysis showing advantages for the high fat diet. The differences, admittedly, are not large, typically a couple of kilos. But remember, these are low-intensity interventions. So they don't show what can happen, and so people have trouble complying with dietary change over the long term. This does not show what the maximum effect could be, but it, um, it um, strongly conflicts with the notion that fat restriction would without um, voluntary calorie restriction, spontaneously produce weight loss. All right, so the carbohydrate insulin model that I have um, shown you earlier makes a variety of specific predictions. And I'll argue that most of these predictions have at least some evidence uh, of support. Um, more weight loss on high fat than low fat diets, the most weight gain that we see in observational studies aren't due to high fat foods, they're high carbohydrate foods. Um, we, talked, we looked at how the metabolic fuel concentration in the late postprandial phase is uh, depleted on a high carbohydrate diet. And that, at least in animals, that alters fuel partitioning and causes calorie independent fat accumulation. Does, is there evidence of a calorie-dependent effect on energy expenditure in humans? Well, this meta-analysis by a skeptic said, you looked at all studies of energy expenditure on low-carbohydrate and high-carbohydrate diets and said, no, that there is really minimal difference, and if anything, it favors the low-fat diet. So according to this uh, author, um, the carbohydrate insulin model has been falsified. That was the term that was used. There's a problem with this meta-analysis. The median length of most of these studies were less than one week. So, why is that an issue? Well, we know, for, we've known for decades that adaptation to low-carbohydrate diets, to changes in macronutrients, take a while. How do we know that? Well, let's look at starvation, the classic starvation studies. Starvation is the ultimate low-carbohydrate diet. And in starvation, ketones rise. Ketones are the hallmark of starvation. But they don't happen overnight. It takes about three weeks for ketones to reach steady state. After six days, you're barely halfway there. We see the same thing in ketogenic diet studies. After six days, for a week, you're barely halfway to steady state ketone levels. And so what do you do? You cut off the fuel supply, 
to the brain. So glucose is the fuel supply to the brain when people are adapted to a high carbohydrate diet. Cut off the fuel supply, and your ketones, which is the perfectly fine fuel for the brain, in fact, some people think it's even a better fuel for the brain. It does, you know, it uh, helps with epilepsy. It may be very, um, it may be therapeutic in neurodegenerative diseases. That's another topic. But ketones haven't reached steady state yet. And you've cut off the glucose supply. So what is, how do you feed the brain? Well, temporarily, you have to borrow from muscle. So you break down maybe a pound of lean mass. We see that because nitrogen balance is more negative for a few weeks uh, on a ketogenic diet. But by a month, you're back to baseline. And so these are transient effects. They don't tell us anything about what would happen on these diets over the long term. So we need a longer study, and that was the purpose of our FS2 study, which was published in late 2018 in BMJ. And uh, here's the study design. We uh, took uh, our participants, they entered a run and weight loss phase where they lost on average about 10% of their weight. They started out at least overweight. And um, then we randomly assigned them to high, moderate, or low carb diets for not six days, but 20 weeks. And we followed their metabolism during this time period. And we also adjusted calories to maintain the weight loss. So the key point is we locked their body weight at whatever they had lost, that 10% weight. If they started, you know, so somebody who went from 200 pounds to 180, uh, we'd lock them weight there. If they started gaining weight, we'd cut back their calories. If they started losing weight, we'd give them more calories. We had 164 participants initially. Our uh, intention to treat analysis included almost all of them. And we had a per protocol analysis of the 122 people whose weight did not deviate by more than two kilograms from target. The diets were high, moderate, or low carbohydrate, 60, 40, 20 percent carbohydrate, and 20, 40, 60 percent fat. Protein was held the same. And here's the primary finding. So energy expenditure measured by doubly labeled water compared to uh, post-weight loss baseline, so this was before randomization, was about 210 or 280 calories in the ITT and the per protocol analysis higher on the low carbohydrate diet than on the high carbohydrate diet, which were highly significant comparisons. The so people's met metabolic rate at the same weight was faster. Now this has um, a major implication, several major implications. One is this difference, if we weren't controlling their weight, that difference in energy expenditure should spontaneously lead to about 20, 25 pounds of weight loss over three or four years. So that could be important by itself. Moreover, it suggests the type of calories we eat could affect the number of calories we burn. So the left side of the energy balance equation influences the right side. And maybe restricting processed carbohydrates might be easier than trying to restrict calories. Now, um, when the study was published, uh, well, I guess you know you are doing uh, impactful work when you get the attention of your scientific opponents. Um, we, um, we posted the full database. It's a it was a huge database for a study of the size, size immediately upon publication. Um, to promote scholarly dialogue. Although not all of the, the dialogue was scholarly. Um, Vox talked about the fierce scientific debate over the study. Uh, an advisory board to professional societies argued why you shouldn't trust this new low-carb diet. That, that's, I mean, why is it a matter of trust? You look at the post of the data and you criticize it or not. So, um, we um, recently published in International Journal of Obesity a response to all of the criticisms of this study. And um, I encourage you, we paid for open access, so I encourage you to go. For those of you who are interested in the back and forth, this is a relatively short article. I think that we, um, in my view, convincingly can uh, dismiss 
the, um, the criticisms on this study that relate to uh, doubly labeled water methodology and non-compliance and other issues. But I'll just argue, I'll just show you one piece of unpublished data. It's, um, it's undergoing um, revision, requested revision. If our methodology was accurate, you know, in other words, if the doubly labeled water was accurately telling us that energy expenditure was higher on the low carb diet. We should have had to feed people on the low carb diet more, right? Because we were holding their weight the same. So um, if they're burning off more calories, we would have had to give them more calories. That's just the law of physics. Now, so w this wasn't a trivial thing because we had to go back to our dietary records, which included over 100,000 individual meals, which I know Susan can appreciate having done studies like this. So um, we did that, and um, we found that, in fact, the calorie requirements, so this is the calorie intake um, just by itself or adjusted for change in fat mass by DEXA, that the calorie requirements parallel very closely our energy expenditure findings. About 200 to 250 calories, 200 to 300 calories higher on the low-carb diet than the high-carb diet, with the moderate-carb diet right in the middle. So I'll argue that this study provides now at least some evidence for a calorie-independent effect of macronutrients um, on energy expenditure and metabolism. I'm not arguing that this is definitive. We certainly need more research. Um, but a number of the predictions of the carbohydrate insulin model have published support. Now, I've argued that in this model, the processed carbohydrates specifically that have entered the food supply, not just the amount, but the processing of the carbohydrate, increased insulin secretion. And at least for vulnerable people, not necessarily everyone, I don't have time to go into it, but we, there's evidence to indicate effect modification by baseline um, insulin secretion status. People who secrete a lot of insulin uh, are, those, for genetic or other reasons, are going to be more susceptible to this carbohydrate than others. Um, so that that, for susceptible people, are triggering excessive fat storage. That's causing the fuels in the blood to drop off in the late postprandial period, that's driving hunger. And that's affecting our energy expenditure. But this isn't a single nutrient, uh, single hormone model. Um, you, models have to have a name. You know, you can't call it the carbohydrate, insulin, fatty acid, prebiotics, protein, macronutrients, sleep stress, physical activity, and endocrine disruptor model. You know, just it wouldn't fit into a title. But what this model offers is an intellectual infrastructure for understanding how a range of biological influences could be driving weight gain independently of our willpower. And so I think that this, uh, regardless of the relative role of carbohydrate, whether it's a lot of the story or just part of the story, um, I think this model um, has appeal to understand, again, why people have such a hard time with calorie restriction. And why is it that the body fights back so early into calorie-restricted diets? This model provides an explanation. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to note that um, when you, so the, 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 um, the diets that we used in our studies were not ketogenic. They all had sufficient carbohydrate to prevent uh, ketosis. But when you go into, you take the next step, you go below 20%, especially when you get below 10% carbohydrate, um, the body uh, enters ketosis, this alternative fuel to feed the brain. And uh, these are the three main ones, but the beta, that should be beta hydroxy, yeah, beta hydroxy butyrate, that's the dominant ketone, the hallmark of the ketogenic diet. These may have additional effects on the body through other mechanisms beyond just lowering blood sugar and insulin levels. Ketones are ancient signaling molecules that affect all sorts of primal, uh, primordial 
um, energy metabolism systems. They affect the inflammasome. They affect the expression of genes. They ex affect redox states in cells with possible anti-cancer effects and anti-aging effects. So this, is, this research is in its infancy, but um, there's very interesting, promising, uh, very preliminary data for the use of ketogenic diets for a range of chronic diseases beyond weight control. Um, and I just want to mention the most um, important chronic disease we think of um, today related to diet, which is diabetes. Uh, again, preliminary evidence of potential special efficacy of a low-carbohydrate or ketogenic diet. Diabetes is a state of carbohydrate intolerance. So it never really made, made much sense to me why we would be recommending high-carbohydrate diets for the state of carbohydrate intolerance. That has been the recommendation up until recently. You now the recommendations have liberalized a little bit, saying that there's no one macronutrient. But if you read recommendations for people with diabetes today, they'll typically say start with about 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal and then adjust. That's a lot of carbohydrate for a pancreas and a uh, body that can't handle it. So um, in this study, the adults randomized control trial of adults with uh, glucose intolerance or diabetes, we were put onto a very low carbohydrate diet, ad libitum, so eat as much as you want, not focused on calorie restriction, versus a calorie restricted um, conventional high carbohydrate diet. Medication usage decreased more on the low-carbohydrate diet. That's a, by itself a big benefit. And despite the greater decrease in medication usage, hemoglobin A1C declined more. That combination is especially compelling in diabetes. They also lost substantially more weight. Um, we looked at type 1 diabetes. Now that's um, the traditionally the, called the juvenile onset diabetes caused by a uh, defect in the pancreas's ability to produce um, uh, insulin. And this is a, a disease in which people have, uh, professionals have been afraid of using low carbohydrate diets, but they were frankly dangerous. They would cause ketoacidosis and hypoglycemia. So we found a Facebook group of people following Dr. Bernstein's recommendation. He's a sort of a somewhat notorious um, physician who recommended very low carbohydrate diets for decades. And there are thousands of people following his recommendations, but they do so mostly quietly because they're afraid that their doctors are going to criticize them for doing this. So we found a Facebook group that was following it. We got IRB approval. We convinced them that we were not going to, you know, we did this in a, in a collaborative way. Some of the participants of the community were authors on the paper. You know, that takes a lot of extra work. You have to go through many extra hoops. But we found, we, we surveyed this community. We got medical records. We documented that they had type 1 diabetes. And we documented their hemoglobin A1C and other outcomes. And we found some surprising things. These people were, in fact, reporting very low carbohydrate intake. They had remarkably low insulin dose, which goes along with a, um, a low carbohydrate intake. Their lipids were classic for low carbohydrate. High LDL cholesterol, but remarkable HDL to triglyceride. A one to one ratio here, indicating exceptional metabolic health, low insulin resistance. The rates of hospitalization for DKA and hypoglycemia were actually lower than published averages, and they were very satisfied, although many of them um, had conflictual relationships with their doctors. And most remarkably, uh, the average hemoglobin A1C was in the normal range. Some people had hemoglobin A1Cs into the fours. Now, I, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I've never seen anything like this in my 25 years of practice. So this is not a randomized controlled trial. We need those. But it raises the possibility of um, perhaps very low carbohydrate diets by reducing insulin demand by avoiding the um, challenges of regulating glucose in this condition might 
be able to reduce micro and macrovascular diseases to a greater degree than we've been able to accomplish with advanced insulin analogs and modern technology. Um, I'm going to skip over fatty liver, which looks uh, very appealing uh, for a low carbohydrate diet. Um, and I think I'll just skip to my conclusion, which is that there is persisting public health harms of this low fat message. You know, we were told for 30 years that eating fat makes you fat and it's going to clog your or arteries. Um, neither, there's no evidence for either. You know, certainly the, the quality of the fats matter, um, although that may vary somewhat if you're eating a very low carbohydrate diet. They are high in saturated fat, but that saturated fat may not have the same adverse effects as it does on a high carb diet. And I, like, I'm not arguing that saturated fat is good for you from a public health perspective. Bread and butter is a bad combination. But if you're eating a very low carbohydrate diet, that saturated fat does not raise serum saturated fat. It burns very quickly. So it may have different implications. In any event, we know that primarily focusing on reducing fat, and my colleague Stu uh, has also been saying this for many years, I think, before many other people, that just reducing fat is not going to be the answer. I think we've seen that. And yet, this paradigm persists. Um, the school lunch program still lets kids have sugary, fat-free milk, but prohibits them from having unsweetened whole milk. Um, there's a, still a nutrition facts label line for total fat. Um, and my favorite is this one. This is the, you, this is still online, <laughs> amazingly. The NIH Go Slow and Woe Foods, which is motivated almost exclusively from a um, energy density fat is bad paradigm. So it says that you should eat whole groups of breads pastas, tortillas, you can eat them almost any time as long as they have fiber in them, or whole grain, so to speak. And they're better than peanut butter or nut, uh, or vegetables that are fried in olive oil. And um, white bread, white rice, French toast, and biscuits and waffles are actually better than whole eggs if you cook those eggs in butter. Um, Fat-free frozen yogurt, which we know is basically just a sugar delivery system, is actually better than whole milk. So this is the nonsense that arises from an energy balance perspective. And um, so lastly, I would like to argue that uh, these um, notions that I've uh, presented to you today may be provocative, but they're not new. A leading obesity researcher wrote that the current energy balance theory of obesity which considers only an imbalance between intake of food and expenditure of energy is unsatisfactory. An increased appetite with a subsequent imbalance between intake and output is a consequence of abnormal fat tissue rather than the cause. So does this sound familiar? This is what I'm saying, that, the, that overeating, the title of this talk, is the consequence of getting, gaining weight, storing fat. It's not the cause of it over the long term. That's what he's saying. This was said by Julius Baer in 1941. Thank you for your attention, and please follow me on social media. Great. And I think that leaves uh, uh, 10 minutes. Yes, so um, we'll bring the mic down, and if anyone has questions, feel free to come up. Do you want? So, David, you know, am I in trouble? I love, I oh. love this. Okay, okay, no, no, no bad comments. Okay. Um, that's okay. You, you let me have it too. Better hearing it from friends than uh, enemies, right? Of course, definitely. No, no, no. I mean, I think you've made extraordinarily important contributions to nutrition science. But if I think about you know, like saying, okay, 40% fat is healthier than 20% fat, which I agree. And that's what we all consumed in the 1960s or whatever. I don't think that just 
turning back the clock and saying, okay, everybody should now eat 40% fat is going to solve things, right? Because you've got obesity and the defense of the new set points or whatever, the defense of the new body weight. So, you know, what would you propose doing now as public health initiatives? Right. Yeah. So, uh, that's, so first you're, you're raising an interesting question about whether body weight set point sort of settles into a new higher level. And we don't know that yet. That's a proposal. Um, although there's evidence to suggest that that might not be as much the case as we fear. Certainly in animal models, you can um, make an animal fat by giving it drugs or giving it insulin or overfeeding it, and then after that stimulus is removed, it returns to baseline. Your own study, uh, which I cite often, of overfeeding. You overfed young men, um, they gained weight, they were miserable during it, and then you stopped overfeeding it, and then you had the brilliance to follow them up um, after a few months. And they had all basically fallen back to their previous weight, and some had overshot and actually became thinner, suggesting that overfeeding might be a good way to produce long-term weight loss. So we don't yet, we don't yet know. Um, and some of this upregulation may have to do with other things beyond obesity, beyond diet, like endocrine disruptors. Um, I, my public health message, to answer your question, is that I think for most people, um, just focusing on reducing processed carbohydrates um, will get us much of the way there. Um, now, for, and so that means less white bread, white rice, potato products, added sugar, and you could replace that with either whole fruits, legumes, truly minimally processed grains, or uh, you could replace some of those with healthy fats. Olive oil, nuts, avocado, dark chocolate. For people with severe metabolic dysfunction, type 2 diabetes is the ultimate metabolic meltdown. Uh, for them, I think my best shot right now is that a very low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet is absolutely the way to go. I think that th that will produce benefits that can't be obtained um, when you're severely insulin resistant, eating a lot of carbohydrate. Maybe they can transition to a higher carbohydrate diet. But remember, like a third of the country is going to develop type 2 diabetes. So this is not, you know, a small minority. Hey, how's it going? My name is Brandon Ransom. I run a local uh, company, digital health uh, and community wellness program called Include Wellness. Right. So I'm, I'm really trying to find out uh, from you, how does this translate into a community setting? There's a lot of good things that come from saying, okay, uh, have these whole grains, legumes, olive oils uh, translated, but I'm trying to think about messaging and how, how you relay this information. Within the, you have op uh, optimal wellness for, not, for life. How do you, outside of the scope of having your physician, having your uh, medical team translate this to uh, actually have effective health communications for relaying this style of messaging? Right. So that's a great question. How do we translate? And that would be not just another one-hour seminar, but that would be like a whole year's discussion or a decade's discussion. Um, and I'm not sure that I can do justice to that answer, although, again, the question is really important. But what I, but let me just say that a key foundation to public health is getting the science right. We put, we've spent billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, promoting a low-fat message that was not biologically sound. And so not only was it at the least a waste of money, but, protect, but it was a wasted opportunity, and it might have actually made things worse. So what I'm proposing is we've got to get the science right first, and then we have to deal with the critical issue of translation, um, but we can then incentivize the food industry and create nutrition policy. I mean, this is tough, Friedman School, so big on policy here. You can create policy that creates an environment where those changes are going to be easier to make happen. But again, first, let's get the science right. Rob, I think we've got a, okay. 
Thank you for the nice uh, talk. I, I'm came a little bit late, so sorry. I may miss part of the important uh, talk. So my question is, a lot of uh, type 2 diabetes patients, they have uh, renal issues. So is that safe for, for them to use this low-carb diet? Yeah, so let me clarify that low-carbohydrate and ketogenic diets are not necessarily high in protein. And in fact, ketogenic diets are specifically not high in protein. They have prevailing amounts of protein. If you bring protein up, if you bring protein up to like 30, 35 percent, as in some of the high protein diets, you will specifically restrain ketosis because protein, amino acids, are a gluconeogenic substrate. So the big concern is too much protein in the case of kidney disease, and so that can be avoided. Um, I, I know of no evidence that. The kidneys themselves need carbohydrate more than any other organ, and um, uh, whereas uh, for people without kidney disease, there's no evidence that high protein intake is a concern at all. Now, that doesn't. Uh, the, a related issue is whether um, this pushes toward animal, you know, increased intake of animal products, and uh, it may, but it doesn't have to. Um, there's absolutely no reason why one can't eat a plant-based low-carbohydrate or even ketogenic diet. Um, and there's a large um, Facebook group, 50,000 people, doing just that, eating their ketogenic diets as vegans. So there's a false notion that ketogenic diets are necessarily, you know, 20-ounce T-bone steak every night. Um, and that's, that's not the case. There is, in fact, a lot of flexibility in the types of foods you eat. Um, the main thrust of a ketogenic diet is substituting the carbohydrates for fat, which can be plant-sourced. I think uh, Rob had a question. Thanks. So you mentioned that it's uh, time to get the food industry sort of on the right side, and I might propose that maybe they don't want to be on the right side for an actual interesting reason. And uh, so something I learned recently was that dairies actually make a lot of their money by stripping out their fat and selling low fat milk. And so they like selling, uh, you know, taking that out and getting another uh, commodity out of their product. And uh, they may, I don't know, it starts to may make less money, they just sell whole milk. So there might be some interesting economic barriers to what you're proposing. Well, there's no question that there are going to be challenges in uh, motivating the food industry to do the right thing. But remember, the food industry is not immoral. They're amoral. They, they're, their priority is to make money. That's their fiduciary responsibility in a capitalist society is to promote shareholder value. You can do that by selling healthy foods or, un un or unhealthy foods, depending upon the playing field. We've created a playing field that maximizes unhealthy foods. Now, I'm not saying it's all going to be very easy, but with very straightforward, like uh, you, the dean here, Dari Mustafarian, and I, um, along with an economist, wrote a, a piece for JAMA proposing a, just a modest tax on processed foods with the revenue used to subsidize healthy, less processed foods. And with that change alone, we could dramatically change the food supply. You would incentivize the industry to start making a whole different set of foods. And it, what it also does is externalize the costs of the junk food. You know, the foods that are promoting obesity, diabetes, increasing cancer risk, neurodegenerative diseases, they're costing society through Medicare, Medicaid, you know, um, SSI. So why not, just like we do with the red taxes, have those costs in the product themselves? This is a capitalist solution. This is an, an open market solution. Um, time, it's a Pigovian tax is the term for it. So there, you know, I don't think that you know, we like to sometimes blame the food industry. And I've been no fan of the industry. I've criticized the industry in my writings a lot. But um, let's remember that they were responding to a dominant mindset when they gave us the low-fat Twinkie. And we can 
make it, we can incentivize the industry to do very different things. Thanks, Dr. Lovely. Uh, Thank you.